Hello and welcome to We Work Together, a new podcast about working in partnership to improve the health and care of people in West Yorkshire and Harrogate, and the relationships between the organisations and people involved. In this episode, Kia Schielacher, Programme Director for Mental Health, Learning Disability and Autism at West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership, talks to Dr Sarah Munro, Chief Executive at Leeds and York Partnership Foundation Trust, and the Mental Health, Learning Disability and Autism Lead for West Yorkshire and Harrogate. Their detailed and fascinating conversation covers workforce issues, improving collaboration and Sarah's approach to leadership. One of the kind of things we talk about with regards to the NHS is the fact that it is always there for us when we're in need. Um, whoever that may be, and the fact that it's free at the point of need. Um, but for people who have kind of complex needs or who struggle to access or engage with services, that doesn't always feel like that. And actually, mm. in reality, it's not always the case that it's kind of easy to access uh, when they're in, in most need. So, kind of one of the, um, the questions I often have is, well, how do we how do we help our staff understand the needs of those people and make sure that we are helping everybody access services? So the first thing I would say is uh, being a provider of specialist mental health and learning disability services and the fact that a lot of the work that we do through the collaborative is more at the specialist end is that there is um, a lot of provision and a lot of staff who are really passionate and expert at meeting the needs of people with complex needs and when I think about complex needs I think about people who've got serious mental illness such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, dual diagnosis often and also in terms of people with a learning disability who have got real complex needs and very often uh, quite severely affected by autism as well. The challenge we've got is a lot of that goes unseen and unknown. It's not something that is generally understood, recognised. Before I trained as a mental health nurse, I had no idea what went on in hospitals that treat people with mental health issues and learned disability. So a lot of what we see in the public-facing um, literature, me- mainstream media campaigns tends to be focused around the mild to moderate end of yeah. mental health, and we talk about that in the context of the left shift. So the first thing we need to do is to better share and showcase the provision that's already there from a complex needs point of view. And I think when you start to do that, that highlights the need to invest in that area. Um, So if we think about in some of the work that we're doing through the collaborative on rehab and recovery, what we know that every year across West Yorkshire and Harrogate, we spend roughly £10 million on people having to go out of area that have got complex mental health needs such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder to get rehabilitation because we're not able to meet their needs within West Yorkshire and Harrogate and that's roughly about 100 people is the work that we know. Once you start to know that information then the question becomes well why aren't we able to meet those needs within West Yorkshire and Harrogate uh, which is one of our priority areas and then we start to have a conversation what's the investment that we would need because staff want to do it they've got the passion to do it but very often they've not got the resources at their fingertips and the challenge at that end of the spectrum is it's not just about health resources it's about access to housing it's about local authority investment in recovery services as well and that starts to get a lot trickier to be able to get the right the right framework commissioned uh, which is obviously something that we're really passionate about doing and key to that is recognising as well which is now in the long-term plan that there are people who need services for long periods of time so again I think politically you see this tends to have been previously a focus on short-term interventions people recover quick turnaround back into employment and off you go you no longer need the support of mental health services which is right and proper for a large volume of people but the biggest spend we have is on those with the most complex needs that often need support for years and sometimes for the rest of their lives um, that are equally valid in terms of the services that we should be providing to them. And I guess one of the kind of reflections that I have talk, so, talking about it as opposed to the totality of what the partnership does and almost kind of what we judge success mm. on, it's quite interesting that sometimes kind of from the NHS point of view you talk about oh how quickly has somebody been seen in, in A&E when yes. they come the four hour target or how, how, how quickly was somebody seen with a cancer diagnosis and sometimes we get accused quite rightly of missing the individual yeah. in that and you know for mainstream physical health services as well there's something about 
what we're doing as a program, as a partnership, to try yeah. and raise awareness on people with a learning disability in particular mm-hmm. or the autism about how we improve the adjustments those services can make with people yeah. with more complex or difficult needs to get into a normal GP appointment, for yeah. example, as well, and kind of how that works. Yeah, so, again, and the biggest data we've got is if you look at overall mortality and morbidity mm-hmm. data for people with serious mental illness and learning disability, and the fact that um, we had some data presented at one of the leadership forums last year on, on looked at attendance at A&E of people that have got registered with a serious mental illness... Um, but overall have worse outcomes so then you take it back a step and think well what's the access to primary care in the first place and how difficult people can find it to turn up um, and get the support that we need and then there's the issue of diagnostic overshadowing so that if you've got known to have a learned disability or serious mental illness not not because clinicians are bad people doing bad things it's usually because of a lack of an understanding and seeing the person in front of them, seeing the label that they come with, is don't recognise the symptoms that they've got and then see it as part and parcel of symptoms of the mental illness or as a feature of having a learned disability and that translates into poorer outcomes overall. So that's the system challenge that we've got of how we get that recognised by all parts of the system that ultimately has a direct impact on outcomes for individuals. So what advice do, should we give, do you think, um busy frontline mm. staff who kind of haven't necessarily got the time to really compute all this stuff yeah. sometimes kind of what's the one thing I guess that we would say to them is it as simple as that that phrase you just used so just kind of you know, just treat the person in mm. front of you don't treat them as the next person through the door kind yeah. of, or is there is there something more that we could be doing to support our staff uh, that's a really hard question to answer <laughs> because if there was one thing we could do I suspect yeah. we would have done it by yeah. now because this isn't this has been a feature of the work we've tried to do to improve outcomes for years and years. We've not just, you know, come up with it as uh, as a particular issue for West Yorkshire and Harrogate. It's a national challenge that we've got when you look all across Mm. the country and, you know, it's been consistent for years in terms of those adverse outcomes. So whatever we're doing now clearly isn't tackling it. Mm. This is the first challenge we need to put ourselves because we're not seeing that systematic change. So when I was doing my... PhD, which was around attitudes towards uh, people that were have got mental health problems in acute mental health settings. One of the important factors that came out of something that has a positive impact on the attitudes and behaviours of staff, and this was even mental health staff, was whether they had their own lived experience yeah. or somebody within their family had personal and lived experience. Um, was the most powerful predictor mm-hmm. of more positive attitudes and consequently the, the way that they behave towards people mm-hmm. that they were providing care to. And then the next best thing was where people had had exposure and training from people with lived experience or carers. So it's, it's kind of on a continuum of um, if you've lived it, you've experienced it, you can never not know that experience mm-hmm. and you carry that with you. That's the way we are as human beings. The next best thing is breaking down that divide. So how do we give clinicians, professionals, access to and exposure to people that have got serious mental illness, learned disability, that is out and not part of that day-to-day clinic Mm -hmm. setting. So not just I'm here to do my job, how can I sit alongside you in a different forum in order to understand and that translate into the practice that I've got. How you do that is I've not got all the answers for, but my experience tells me that's the way that we should be approaching it because an e-learning package, a training course, uh, doesn't really get, deliver the results. And that's no different when you look at inclusivity of leadership around staff and different groups and their experiences of working in the NHS, of how you get as close as possible to lived experience. What do we feel about how how we consider the needs of our own staff and yeah. their mental health at work? Do we feel that the NHS and our kind of care partners are doing enough? Uh, or are we kind of are we taking that learning and applying mm. it to the people who work for us as well? Yeah. Are we doing enough? No. If you look at the rates of sickness absence across the NHS and even within my own organisation, uh, staff that are off sick because of stress and mental health related issues. Um, is high and higher than we would want it to be. So that's and that's part of the national P- NHS people plan, isn't it? The interim mm-hmm. and what will be in the final plan. There's more we need to do around health and well-being of staff. So it becomes how do you make that an explicit conversation with staff who turn up to work each day and think, well, my job's there to care for other people. And I think it was Michael West 
when you talked about compassionate leadership and compassion starts with being compassionate to yourself because if you don't show compassion to yourself then your ability to show compassion towards others is limited um, or is going to become limited over time so I think there's a uh, there's a cultural piece which is really shifting the dial on permission is the wrong word but it feels like it's almost giving permission to say and actually it's okay to talk about our own health and well-being and that be legitimate alongside the health and well-being of the people that we're providing care to not to see it as you've got to keep them separate from one another um, and, and certainly in mental health I talk with staff about you know the one in four we are the one in four and I've worked with enough people over the years colleagues mental health professionals um, that have suffered from mental health problems mm-hmm. themselves sometimes because that was part and parcel of things that were going on for them and some of it was directly work related mm-hmm. and having had um experience of traumatic events in work so I I think there's an added risk factor for staff providing health and care because the nature of the job sometimes is especially uh, traumatic uh, both psychologically and physically in the demands that it puts on people which means that we need to have an even more explicit conversation but it is that culture shift around so the, the legitimacy of saying it's okay to talk about your own health and well-being and that doesn't in any way take the focus away from the care that you're providing to citizens. Once you start to unlock that conversation and people feel safe and able to talk about uh, what things feel like for them, that's the left shift we need to see from the, if, you know, if the end point is reducing sickness absence and the distress and trauma that staff experience, the left shift is about starting to have those conversations early, which is, that's something I've really struggled with mm-hmm. today and getting that day, that support at the point of need, not building up to the point where you no longer feel able to just turn up to work because when you're not in work again we know work is important in terms of routine yeah. and connecting to purpose and all of that so then you're just compounding over time if you start to not able to engage in the things that you know are positive in terms of structure and day-to-day routine and social contacts yeah. and peer support networks yeah and it kind of strikes me that there's a an almost an opportunity and we talk about Certainly, in previous roles when I've worked nationally with the NHS, we talk about the NHS being a leader yeah. of kind of other groups or the professions mm-hmm. in the way we kind of um, go about our business. Yeah. And the, the point you make about staff and sickness absence mm-hmm. is kind of um, kind of the opposite of that in a lot yeah. of ways. That kind of the, the absence rates are quite high, mm-hmm. but actually, there's an opportunity for the NHS to lead the way in how we treat and care for yeah. our staff, which you know, with those staff who are und- you know, doing those roles that. Do, are traumatic mm. as well in other areas of, of kind of the public services in particular whether it be the police or the yeah. fire service or the military there's options for them to learn as well and that might have over time kind of cascade down into wider bits of society yeah. as well so when we're yeah. talking about kind of how we help the wider society kind of have the right conversation about mental health if we can't do it yeah. and to cascade yeah. down from the NHS to start with it's going to be a bit of a, yeah. a struggle That's really. a good point. And I guess kind of the flip side of all that, though, is, is I suppose it's kind of about, we, we talk about this term a lot, it's kind of not the nicest word to use sometimes, but the resilience mm. of staff as well. Can you we know that particularly for mental health nursing, certainly for learning disability nursing as well, there's a, you know, there are gaps in recruitment. Yeah. We're struggling to yeah. recruit people in those professions a lot of the time. Some of that is often down to just how complex and tough those jobs can yeah. be. I get, what is it that we kind of need to do with the future workforce, I guess, as well, on kind of convincing them that this is a that this is a place yeah. that is valuable to work in, not just they'll get the support, but that they're kind of, their kind of careers are rewarding, interesting. Yeah. They're tough, but they'll be supported. When we talk about the kind of the NHS workforce or the health and care workforce, and we st- we start by talking about the challenges that we face in terms of recruitment, retention, mm-hmm. sickness, absence, and I started off by talking about sickness mm-hmm. rates. In all fairness, um, actually, what we should talk about is the fact that you know. How many thousands of people turn up to work every day of the year, 365 yeah. days a year, will work shift patterns, which means that they they see their colleagues sometimes in a week more than they see their own family members. And the majority of them do enjoy it. Mm. They get a sense of satisfaction. They know they're making a difference in the lives of other people. That's why people keep turning up, otherwise they wouldn't do. It's not like there's a, uh, in, for some you know professional groups, a shortage of opportunities elsewhere. Mm. So perhaps if we flip it and think, well, there already is a compelling case of the staff that continue, we continue to be committed no matter how, you know, sometimes it's a tough week, you enjoy it and still want to come back and do it all again uh, the very next day. That's the bit we don't sell enough. We do tend to flip into the, like a deficit model, isn't it, of the the areas where we've got problems. And I remember when I 
was doing my nurse training, lots of people chose to do general nursing because they felt as though there wasn't the same breadth of opportunities in mental health. Yeah. And that comes back to, you know, that first conversation we're having of people not really understanding what happens in specialist mental health services. Yeah. And if you look at the breadth of provision that we've got now, there's a huge amount of opportunities for people to have much more varied mm. careers. Uh, that's the stuff that we need to get out there and and talk about in more detail, yeah. uh, which I think is attractive then for people to want to become and become a part of. Yeah, and is there something also about um, how we how we you know, almost change the the model of what we expect people will do in their time mm. when working in the NHS? Because yeah. I think there's still a a recognition or an expectation. Certainly, even when I kind mm. of you know I can start, still for some reason count myself as young in NHS terms. Uh, still, you know, an expectation that kind of you join the NHS and you want to be there for life almost. Yeah. It's a kind of career you know for forty years or so. There's a definite generational shift yes. in young people coming through now, not to do with the NHS per se, mm. but what they expect from their yeah. job, which is more about actually what's the portfolio that my career is going to look yes. like and, I, and that is either that I might spend two days a week doing something and then three days a week mm-hmm. doing something else or actually I might do a bit of for example teaching for 15 years then yes. I want to move into something mm-hmm. different or kind of want to do a different challenge that actually the same is probably true of our nursing workforce in particular I don't know if it's quite the same for medics but it'd be interesting mm-hmm. to kind of explore that but for the nursing workforce for kind of the management workforce for the kind of the support staff workforce that we, yeah. there's actually a whole cohort of people who may be ready for their career change into kind of mental health nursing nursing, yeah. nursing at a, a older age yeah. and by that point they may have gained some of those things you talked about earlier mm-hmm. that lived experience yeah. that understanding that is a bit more powerful mm-hmm. so is there more as a partnership I guess we can do to go there's an attractive career change here for people yeah. reaching that kind of time in their life. Yeah, there is. And while you were just talking, Kia, it reminded me, if you ask a group of clinical staff why they chose the profession they've mm. done, the majority of the answers will be from an early experience of either having received some form of care, mm. physical or mental health, whatever it may be, a family member is involved in it, um, and that sense of wanting to give something back. And interestingly, the work that Fatima leads Mm. in the partnership on supporting uh, carers, and she talks about the fact that, you know, if you've got people that have been carers, they're a great source of developing your future workforce because they've got a whole set of skills that they could come and... So I, I think there's something about us changing our view on routes into working in health and care. Um... But very often we see things through the lens of a particular academic professional route that you do at a certain age over a certain number of years and then we get and those are absolutely needed and absolutely valuable but we need a lot more than that and we need a lot more diversity of roles which is where our relationship with the voluntary and community sector is really important because of the different skill sets mm. that people can provide the challenge we've got for nursing in particular and we know this is where learned disability and mental health have been hardest hit because typically they do tend to be more mature students um, was the losing the birth rate yeah. um, and you know that's well covered in terms of the data and the evidence of the impact and trying to find ways and means to resolve that and if there isn't a national change in policy which you know people remain hopeful that the, that might be something to reinstate because of the direct impact that we've seen on rates of uh, students applying to do mental health and learning disability in particular, then this is where I think the devolution of um, options through workforce investment to ICSs uh, is the other opportunity that we've got because then you can start to work with HGE academic providers to design something relevant for your local population to meet local needs. So you have, um, so in your role, sorry, you have two big hats, maybe yep. three big hats actually, kind yep. of actually thinking about it. So your role uh, as the Chief Executive of the Eastern York Partnerships Foundation Trust, your role as the SRO for Mental Health Cross Racial Culture in Harrogate, then your role on kind of workforce. Yep stuff you have a kind of an ultimate accountability and the people who technically you know pay your wage yes. is, is leading your partnerships and it's yep. foundation trust and, and the board you're accountable to that board and obviously to the local service users and patients yet you have this system-wide role yep. and also responsibility for, for other stuff too how do you kind of see the tension or the or the opportunities mm-hmm. of those two elements and, and, and kind of you know, are they in competition with each mm. other? Uh, are they kind of mutually exclusive? Or is there a way to navigate this complexity we've got about asking people to do, to don a number of hats yeah. at any one time? 
the biggest crucial factor in in those is having the time and the capacity to do it all well uh, would be the thing that resonates most with me and if you've not got the time or the capacity to be able to do them all well then you need to not do them all <laughs> and, and make sure that what you can do is manageable to deliver the best that you possibly can so for me the role of being the chief exec and then leading in the system stuff the compatible with being the lead in the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Mental Health and Disability and Autism Collaborative uh, because our core business is around providing those services as an organisation and through being part of that partnership means that we can benefit the services that we provide directly through the organisation. Uh, that's because we're not an island, we've not got all the answers or the expertise in LYPFT. Um, when you start to look with your partners and play to where each of us has got different strengths, different opportunities and different expertise, and sometimes you get an economy or an efficiency of scale or workforce by playing into a different footprint, for me then that is beneficial to the organisation. And that's part of that ongoing conversation with the board yeah. in terms of capacity. And then you think, well, I also lead on workforce in Leeds. You know, the bulk of the people that work in this organisation are citizens of Leeds. So it's really important to be connected with the Leeds system around workforce, what that pipeline looks like, how we work together with our partners from primary care, voluntary, local authority and other NHS providers because that's the day-to-day -day lived experience of our citizens of navigating those services. So our workforce needs to be really intertwined in that kind of arrangement as well. Somebody asked me once around capacity and time, before doing the roles, would I have known how much it would pull? No. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Kia, each week is different. Yeah. So I always say some weeks are all about West Yorkshire and Harrogate, some weeks are all about Leeds, and some weeks are just all about being in the trust, getting on and getting stuff mm -hmm. done. And the best thing you can do is have touch points with key people along the way to make sure that you're getting the balance right and paying attention to the things that you need to pay attention to. If we talk about system leadership without ever really defining, I think, what we mean by system mm. leadership. It's now part and parcel of the NHS language, but I reckon if you were to ask the senior leadership executive group that meets first Tuesday mm. of every month, if we were to come up with a definition of system leadership, I'd, I'd be amazed if <laughs> more than two quest. people yeah. <laughs> or two people came up with the same definition yeah. of what it meant for them. Perhaps that's a test we should, <laughs> we should put to them. So here's a... a challenging one. Uh, so if you were given a, uh, a blank sheet of paper and asked to redraw how the NHS and the care system yep. the the NHS that works tomorrow, what's the one thing you would do or change to improve collaboration? What's really tricky is, and what we're finding, is the fact that investment in services, i.e. commissioning, the way that the money flows in order to invest in and pay for the staff and the services that we provide comes from multiple different sources mm. and we understand the history of where it's all come from so at the moment we've got splits between place-based commissioning we've got specialised commissioning there's some services that are commissioned nationally uh, then we've got routes through public health local authority just off the top yeah. of my head that means nothing in terms of the person that needs care and what they need around them so and, and very often then you get into these conversations around, well, who, what funding stream does it come through? Which is, you know, the world that we live in. At the end of the day, if you're somebody needing a service, we just need to be a bit better at getting the money to where it needs to be and getting rid of all of those blockages and boundaries. Which I suppose is the theory around moving to capitated budgets per population. Yeah. So they're held in one place using things like population health management to be able to then target the resource around population need rather than the architecture that we've put in place to control flows of money. So I'd change it. I don't know what the answer is. Perhaps <laughs> it is the capitated budgets. But then what you need, it, that then really relies on strong partnership working at a system level of good relationships and that ongoing dialogue with citizens that you're there to serve so that you're using it in the right way. One thing I have noticed and I you know, value since I've started this role is you in, in your role as a leader and your, your kind of style. I think some of that comes back to um, some stuff you touched on earlier about um, that balance between you know, support and empowering people yeah. and kind of, you know, Structure challenge, all that, all that kind of stuff. But how would you 
describe your own style as a leader mm. and kind of importantly what do you look for from other yeah. people what do you want to see and particularly within the context of this kind of partnership working approach what do we need from yeah. our leadership so how would I describe it myself well, the first word that comes to mind is pragmatic and I think that's about I'm here to work with people to help find the right solutions uh, and I've not got the answers so and that's that's the starting point I'm also um for me, it's all about just how you connect with people. So whilst I might hold a position of being a chief exec, I'm not into hierarchies. I'm not into, uh, you know, difference in how people are valued. At the end of the day, a bit what I said before, you know, everybody comes to work and tries the hardest and puts a huge amount of themselves into the work that they do. And that's what we've all got in common when you work in health and care services and something to be really, really valued. For me, it's really important that you've got that you're optimistic, that you're positive, you know, this is a great job. And the amount of time, so I've been post three years, really struck me with people saying, oh, but you seem so happy, almost <laughs> as though I shouldn't be. Well, of course I've got, a, this is a great job. I'm really enjoying it. I love working in mental health and learning disability okay. services. I love the ability to kind of come and connect with people that are like-minded and just as passionate. Um, so leaders need to do that. Need to show humility, you've not got the answers. You're there to work with just because you've progressed through a certain route doesn't, you know, comes back to that you're not, you're not any more equipped than others. Mm. For me, it's how you create the culture around you, which gives everybody a space to kind of develop. And, and actually leaders should be there to really have the backs of the people that they work with and support and champion um, and shine a light on the good stuff that they do. And never losing connection from the experiences you've had along the way, because absolutely they shape the way that you are um, and are really important. Earlier on in my career, and I was at the university for a few years, and somebody came came across this phrase of people that progress uh, progress through their careers and pull the ladder up after mm. after them. And it's the first time I've heard it, and it's always stuck with me since. And that's that real importance, really. Of you've actually you've got a role, to, you've got an absolute role to play, which is around supporting and developing people around you. Use the opportunity. What you do get is an opportunity, uh, different opportunities when you're in more senior positions. That's the way the system around you works. But actually, you need to use that to give those opportunities to other people for them to grow and develop. Is yeah. the is the best kind of thing that you can do with it. Absolutely, and, th- and that resonates with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about as mm. kind of a system, an extended system leadership exec yeah. in the last couple of weeks or so, uh, particularly with regard to kind of uh, people from black and minority ethnic yeah. groups and the opportunities that they get if there are, you know, quite frankly, kind of white leaders pulling the ladder mm. up after themselves, yeah. it reduces the opportunity it for does. that diversity. Yeah. And, you know, as a partnership, we're really kind mm. of clear that we want to take action to yeah. address that balance. It's, kind yeah. of, it's an important kind of distinction to, to say. Yeah. Um, the other thing is about kind of the work-life balance. Yeah. Bit. So kind of what does that balance look like to you? What, yeah. How do you, you know, make that work? So there's two things in that. One is an understanding about what works for you which I'll talk about in a minute. And the second is having people around you that are your that keep you safe within that as well. Yeah. So, you know, people that can say, Oh, you, you don't normally do that, you know, you, mm-hmm. is everything all right? Because you sent me a flurry of emails, you know, at eleven o'clock at night, which you don't normally do. Is is the job manageable yeah. at the moment? I think it needs to be to be both ways. Um, so I've got two young children. Uh, getting older each year obviously like they all do so 12 and 7 now and when I had Cara I was in a deputy director position so she's the youngest and I remember at the time being really struck by the amount of times it was commented on of somebody in a senior position having a baby and being on maternity leave and it's like well I don't know any different that's just the way that my life has gone but then you think well what what should you use that for? So that's where it kind of over the past couple of years, past few years, the pennies dropped is the importance of talking about that. Yeah. Because other people didn't feel as though that was something that they could do. You had to trade off one or the other. It's either have a family or have a, mm. a career to progress and never the twain shall meet, yeah. uh, which is ridiculous. And it was through a leadership course that I did, the Athena programme, that helped me kind of reconcile that. So, you know, I love my family to bits and I love spending time with them but I also love my job and I love doing my job so the balance has got to be um, between the two and sometimes home life takes over ill kids stuff going on transitions etc etc um, you know wider family members and sometimes there's loads of stuff on at work and the extra hours are going in because you just need to get stuff done 
but this is where having trusted people around you is because if you swing too much one way or the other without somebody just saying is everything all right I think you can quickly go down months can pass and something becomes a bit of a habit and a routine and that then ties into your own health and well-being if you can so it's not it's not a hard and fast rule but paying attention to it I think means that you can be more productive in work and that comes through but also get the balance which means because I was if I feel as though I've, I'm not spending enough time with the kids you come in work and it's playing on your mind and mm. you feel bad about it then I'm not giving 100% attention and if things are really st- stressful at work well you know <laughs> you've got no time for your kids either both need a huge amount of time and attention um, so that's why it's really important and I talk about it because this, the feedback I've had off colleagues is uh, we need to talk about it more to create this kind of culture where it's seen as acceptable and normal that you can have the balance that it's not a hard line between home and yeah. work life what I found you know, refreshing coming to this role mm. is just how, how much more open people are than the previous role, yeah. I think, for example. And there's, there's a lot about uh, bringing your whole self to work, yes, isn't it? Is, and yeah. some of that is about your, your family, some of that is about your own principles and mm-hmm. views, and some of it, frankly, is just about letting people know that you have hobbies. Yeah. And it's about yeah. actually that you're a fully rounded human being mm-hmm. with stuff that you like and don't like, and that creates that you know, environment for work. Yeah. That be, you know, it's easy for people to just come and just do the job, but teams work on understanding. Yeah. And, you know, and that's quite a... Uh, that first step to start to have those different conversations is quite a courageous step, isn't mm, it? It is, and it's hard. But then, in how that landed with colleagues mm. was probably a bit of a oh. We gave legitimacy well. to yeah. others as well, yeah. and particularly and this. I think comes back to the leadership mm. point. If you're in a position of sufficient authority in whatever context yeah. that is, and you take that step, then others will breathe a sigh of relief and go, "Well, maybe I can do it yes. too." And then the whole, you know, the whole kind of dynamic mm-hmm. shifts a little bit, really. Yeah. So we certainly saw that in our, you know, in my kind of previous team, and you know, inevitably it will be the same for chief execs of organisations. Yeah. If it's very obvious to everybody that you know you're able to juggle the work-life yeah. balance and do so with a smile on your face, yeah. that everybody thinks you know, every day is a happy one, yeah. <laughs> then you know it's mm-hmm. going to influence everybody else as well. But you talked a little bit about starting your mental health nursing and your PhD. Yeah. You just want to describe a little bit about your career and kind of where, how you how you ended up in this office okay. with me and Ben oh. today. So the starting point for me is I, until I was finishing my A-levels, never knew I was going to do nursing. Mm. Uh, so this is an important part of uh, me and the route that I've gone. So my mum has literally just finished. She spent 39 years working in the NHS. Uh, she started out as a domestic in the outpatients at the Skin Hospital in Salford. And then when I was doing my A-levels, she was a, a nurse and auxiliary pre-agent for change, I can't remember what the, on the old Whitley grade or something like that, um, at Ladywell Hospital, a hospital for all the people in Salford. And so I asked her what a job was like, spent a bit of time volunteering and decided nursing was the career for me uh, and went to university. So, and when I was doing my nurse training, uh, I, uh, if you'd have said, well, where do I think my career will end up, it was to be a ward manager. So I thought that was the bee's knees. I was at a placement uh, in North Manchester with a fantastic guy who was the ward manager called Mike and he was he was really present he knew everything that was going on on the ward he kind of rolled his sleeves up he was there he was supportive he was visible and I thought oh, one day you know that's going to be me and then incrementally what happens over time is you get to that position so I got to be a ward manager in an acute ward and loved it and I had an amazing team and we did loads of great stuff And but then you look and think well so my ward's doing really great, and that ward's really struggling. Yeah. Well, I need to do something about it. It, it's, it becomes that you get compelled to take on that bit more responsibility, that bit more responsibility, because you just want to mm. you see somewhere need needs help and support. But in the midst of it, I had an opportunity to apply for and was successful to do a PhD. I'd done a master's in between a, in CBT. Um, and so education was really important to me because it was I was the first person in my family to go to university. So every time that it was an offer, determined to just take any opportunity that came up. So I was really lucky. Uh, went off to do a PhD for a few years and then came back. Interestingly, I was told at the time I was making a big career mistake. Right. Uh, that I was leaving the NHS, going off into academia. Sarah, you're ruining your career. What on earth are you thinking of? You would have had a bright career uh, staying in the NHS. And it's like, no, it's, I'll be back. <laughs> This is, you know, I'm going to do this for a few years. It's a, it's an opportunity not to be missed. I really want to study attitudes. Uh, so I came back and I went up to Cumbria as a nurse consultant in acute mental health care. So that's where all my kind of clinical interests were focused around. Um, and then 
I covered a particular part of the patch. And then again, you, you leave some improvement work in one area, and I thought, well, actually, I want to have a bigger influence over the other acute services. And then I became a head of nursing, then a deputy director of nursing. And then I was, again, I've given some rubbish advice, which was, <laughs> if you want to be a director, you'll need to do ops. You can't just come right. up the nursing route. And then a great chief exec uh, I met with um, said, that's not the way it works. What, what you look for in terms of a director is about the skills and qualities, not have you ticked the box with a, a particular uh, pathway that you followed, which was really wise advice and that stayed with me. Um, so and I came to Leeds and I'd never been to Leeds before other than to pass through and uh, some other hospital stuff. And then the job came up here mm-hmm. and being, you know, steeped in mental health services, I mean, it was ideal. Yeah, probably the uh, final question actually really is about, um, so we talked, touched on this slightly about um, leadership opportunities for those who come yeah. after um, essentially. So what are we doing as a partnership mm-hmm. at the minute to try and in- increase the opportunities for uh, leadership roles for you know some of the maybe more marginalised groups yeah. of people who kind of would ordinarily maybe think actually I don't see myself mm. as a leader either because I don't see other people like me yeah. as a leader or because actually kind of think that looks like it's too difficult or yeah. it's too hard or actually I, I, too complex and I won't be able to do it but actually they've got the right value base yeah. because they have got the skills mm-hmm. like you're saying they just might not have followed the route that no. they expect to follow so yeah is there anything from a partnership point of view that we're doing to address that? So the, the work that we did at the leadership event last week with Owen and Fatima and Richard that led, I thought was fantastic, yes. really. And because actually it's stimulating a conversation, isn't it? And, a, and a thinking about something that actually takes time to think about properly. It's not just something that you can quickly pass over. And the, th- and the thing that struck me about that, which I think we need to do more of across the partnership but also in my own organisation and the work that we're doing around inclusion and the experiences of, of staff from different groups. We're not very good at putting stories out there of people that have done really well, that are from BME backgrounds or uh, staff that would you know identify themselves as LGBT or whatever it may be. And that was the stuff that Fat- it really resonated when Fatima talked about her experiences growing up of who were her role models. Because actually we all look to people that you think, oh, I could be like them yeah. one day. And we have got people in our system mm-hmm. uh, that are fantastic leaders and we should share their stories more and celebrate to create uh, role models for other generations of staff. Mm-hmm. As well as I think there is, you know, there are more specific things we can do in terms of reciprocal mentorship, leadership mm-hmm. development programmes and the work that we do around coaching and mentoring and things like that. Uh, but that really struck me in terms of the power of people sharing their stories and the experiences that they'd had. Because it's, it's, it's no different than when I talked about at the start of how do you influence. If you sit alongside to share the experiences of somebody else, whether that's because you've got a mental illness, whether it's mm-hmm. because you're from a BME background, uh, once you've made that human connection, it's the stuff that you can't walk away from in terms of your own attitudes and behaviours. This has been episode four of the We Work Together podcast. Thanks to Kia and Sarah, and thank you for listening. Join us again next time, when we'll be joined by more partners who work together to improve health and care for people in West Yorkshire and Arrogate.